the message is because <laughs> I didn't get to into asking and I don't have the brochure to see. Whatever it is, I tell you that it's going to be interesting. Listen up. In Bar. Self just a little bit. Always turn these down just sound like I'm talking plenty loud. <clears throat> so I'll just move right into this. I hope it works. On Sunday, April 2nd, we had pre unleavened day, work day here at church with the expressed goal of deleavening the church. <clears throat> Just between us, I'm convinced that the Feast of Unleavened is exactly where spring cleaning came from. Always happens in the spring. Imagine that. So anyway, after we left, we stopped at a sandwich shop. <clears throat> Young man asked us having a and I replied that yes we were because we'd been at our church doing our cleaning for the feast of unleavened bread. I could tell he had no idea what we were talking about. <clears throat> but he said, I hope it works. I replied that I was certain that it would because God ordained us to do it. He looked in his eyes again and told me, hey, I haven't got a clue anyway. But again, he said, I hope it works. <clears throat> that brought to my mind something that I had read recently on Facebook, an observation that a lady had made. She keeps seeing lots of messages posted that ask for God to restore and heal our land. But you know what? There's no mention at all of the need to repent and seek forgiveness of Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. But sometimes it seems that people just don't seem to care, you know, about the evil that's becoming so rampant. They don't, they don't want to make necessary changes to their lives to bring peace back to their lives. They just want God to fix it. <clears throat> that's sad. Because even then, God was very open about the fact that we could make it happen. <clears throat> Continuing on, verses 15 and 16. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now this was at the, what do you call it, the coronation, the blessing of the new temple that Solomon had built, right? But you know what? That works right now because where's, where's the building? Where is God going to be forever? Right here. It fits just as now. God's word is always true. But that didn't happen then, did it? Because sadly, even his own chosen people didn't listen to him, did they? But God had known it wouldn't work and was preparing for that. We can find that in Deuteronomy 18. 
where Moses told the people about God's plan. We'll start in 15, go through 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from your midst, like me, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day that is of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, Moses, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them to, to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. There's going to be a test in there. But you see, there are those who will scorn all this information because it's in the Old Testament. People today don't think we need any of that. That's old stuff. But it's all essential because it's our Savior Jesus Messiah who Moses is speaking of. So, let's get some New Testament scriptures and maybe people will listen to that. How many of you remember when Peter and John healed the lame man at the temple? Acts 3, 1 through 11. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who came by who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. I just kind of, you know, kind of picture this guy. He is having a great day. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, I can imagine that. He wasn't letting them get away. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. Looks like it got a whole bunch of people's attention, doesn't it? Then Peter explained to the people that it wasn't his and John's power that healed that man, but it was the power of Jesus, the Holy Son of God, who they had crucified, but who God had raised up from the dead. And Peter told them, not all was lost. <clears throat> Taking it up at 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers. We're going to go through the 26. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his, all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Now he tells them what they and every one of us must do. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come, from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to his fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Remember it's Deuteronomy that I was quoting to you earlier. And it shall be that every soul 
who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Again, there's, there's consequences. <clears throat> yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed, as Genesis 22, 18. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Now realize that Peter and John were speaking to the Jews here, right? So what about the rest of the world? Paul explains this in his letter to the Romans. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's from that Old Testament book, Habakkuk 2.4. That's the only way for anybody, Jew or Gentile, to find salvation. Through living in faith in Christ alone, not by just asking God to make it all better, while we continue to live and act in the same way that got us in trouble in the first place. We need to realize how special this means we are. And I don't mean special in a spoiled way. Well, I'm special. I don't have to do anything. No, not in a spoiled way, but rather that God loves us, mankind, so very much that he's worked from the very beginning, before the fall, actually, I believe, to save us from the destruction that Satan planned at that fall. So John 3, 16 through 21, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. That's the key. We must all come to Christ and live according to his words. Hebrews 2.1, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. I guess you guys have been able to hear me. I just realized now that I hadn't turned this thing on, so it's a good thing I'm speaking up. <clears throat> Otherwise, Richard would have been. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. I get to thinking about that last phrase, lest we drift away. Brings to my mind a mental picture of someone sleeping in a little boat out there in the waves, lying on an air mattress, or just swimming at the beach and slowly getting pulled out by riptide. <laughs> slowly carries them away to destruction. It's easy to understand because that's a real danger. It's easy, uh, it here's how you deal with it. Unless we determine to follow God, We can truly drift away from him. Don't believe it? Look at what has happened to our society. 
I used to hear old people talk about back in the old days. Now I are one, and I remember the old days. We as kids, we'd go out in the morning, we'd play all day long, all over, come back home in the evening, nobody worried about us. <clears throat> Look at and assess how far we of a nation, as a nation have fallen from following God. It's heartbreakingly massive in scale. And it has happened because we have drifted away. Little at a time, little at a time, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I'm out here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and here comes a hurricane or something. My main focus is this. How do we turn our world around and stop this sinful, murderous reality that seems to be growing worse day by day? The only answer that I can find is this. Pay attention to what will happen if we don't obey God. And I'm going to use Second Chronicles. It's not the only place, however, if you guys want to you know, look in Scripture and find it, there's other places. <clears throat> Humble ourselves. It's usually our pride and arrogance that gets us in trouble. <clears throat> Makes us think we can ignore God, we can do anything we want, because, you know, I'm me. Pray and seek God's face. There are many examples throughout the Bible of how people have zealously and victoriously sought God's face and made a difference. Turn from our wicked ways. Continuously and vigorously repeat as needed. Right? Get in trouble? Humble ourselves and pray. Seek God's face. Turn from our wicked ways. Happens again? Humble ourselves and pray. Seek God's face. Turn from our wicked ways. If people still need a New Testament passage. Let's go with this one. Acts 2, 36 through 41. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Again. Pretty well works with the, what we're going with now. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Just think of the difference that kind of revival can make in our nation. Because if we don't turn around, it will definitely get worse. <clears throat> 